Thank you all for joining us today for Displacement and Creative Activism. We are excited to have with us a remarkable group of speakers, all of whom have worked to change our understanding and experience of the political forces of displacement. Before I get into some of the guiding thoughts behind this seminar, I would like to, first and foremost, offer thanks to our sponsors, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, Middle East Studies, the Department of Modern Culture and Media, and the Department of Art History and Architecture. Julia and I would also offer, offer our sincere gratitude to Barbara Oberkoder, Rachel Easterbrook, Vikram Thakur, Sarah Tobin, Ariella Azulai, and Bashar Dumani, um, as well as the folks at Watson and Brown facilities, uh, without whom today would not be possible. So with that, a few words, and I promise to be quick. Um, Displacement has been a structuring force impacting the work of creative practitioners around the globe throughout the modern period. As a prominent factor shaping forms and subjectivity, power relations of inclusion and exclusion, institutions of state authority, and industrial and creative production, displacement has at the same time served as a site of resistance for artists, architects, and other creative practitioners. Thus, while creative work speaks to and is shaped by the forces of displacement, it can be oriented, perhaps in a self-reflexive manner, toward the material and epistemological frameworks and institutions through which it engages the world. The work here speaks to borders, state powers, political and economic relationships, and other forces driving displacement. I want to take a minute to unpack our thoughts behind the creative part of creative activism in our title. In marvelous ways, the work to be, the work to be presented today reveals for us a view of the possibilities with which one can be an activist and engage with a world that often works unjustly. Perhaps a commonality to be found between Sandy, Khaled, and Marcos is a materialist approach. And this can be seen in their working on site and their creation or recreation of social edifices, with working materials ranging from concrete to concepts themselves. It can and has been said that much of the work of these creative practitioners performs or enacts critique, decolonization, or even deconstruction, certainly each a different form of engagement with the world, and certainly each with different geohistorical meanings and implications. But we feel that what their work at the same time reveals is the creative, that is, the generative aspect of, of such engagement. It is not simply to tear down, no matter how just this may seem, but also to articulate possibilities. The best work of this kind does this. So what we hope to do with this fifth seminar in the Displacement and the Making of the Modern World series is to have Sandy, Khaled, and Marcos introduce each to their work and experiences, and then for us to facilitate a conversation that explores their relation to the forces and institutions of displacement, and perhaps, which perhaps reveals how such experiences complement and resonate with each other as much as how they reveal very specific social phenomena. And you are invited at this portion to, uh, when we get to the Q&A, to, to join us, and join this conversation with your questions. So here to introduce you to our speakers is the co-organizer of this event and Mellon Sawyer graduate fellow, Julia Gell. Thank you again, everyone, for coming. Um, our first speaker, our first speaker is uh, Sandy Hilal, a Palestinian architect, artist, and educator whose work has been featured in museums and biennials across the world. She is a former director of UNRWA's Camp Improvement Program in the West Bank and is co-author, along with her partner Alessandro Petty and fellow architect A. I. Weizmann, of Architecture After Revolution. Uh, she, Petty, and Weizmann are also co-founders of the Decolonizing Architecture Art Residency, a collective of artists, architects, and activists dedicated to practical spatial subversions and discursive critique that together resist physical and discursive structures of occupation. Sandy holds a PhD in Transborder Policies for Daily Life from the University of Trieste and is currently an artist in residence at Bard College. Our second speaker, Khaled Malas, is a Syrian architect and PhD candidate at NYU's Institute of Fine Arts, where he studies art history, criticism, and conservation, with a particular focus on Islamic art and architecture. His work has been featured in the Venice and Marrakesh Biennales, where his construction served as uh, both physical interventions to improve the lives of displaced people, and discursive interventions that help us rethink questions of war, infrastructure, and power. 
Khaled also holds degrees from the American University of Beirut and Cornell University, and is a member of various associations, including the Arab Image Foundation, the Historians of Islamic Art Association, and the London Institute of Pataphysics. Our final speaker for today is Marcos Ramirez Erre, a visual artist whose prolific career has spanned nearly three decades and an incredibly wide range of artistic media, including sculpture, performance inst installations, photography, video, and even postcards. Through projects such as Delimitations with David Taylor, Troy and Horses, A Game of Deception of Oil, Soccer, and Other Bets, and most recently, So Close and So Far with Andrea Bowers, he has explored issues of identity, race, culture, and community, frequently delivering biting commentary through physical means. Originally from Tijuana, he, learned, he earned a law degree from the Universidad Autónoma de Baja California and worked in the construction industry in the US for 17 years before turning to artistic practice. His work has recently taken an increasingly global dimension with in situ projects in China and Germany, in addition to a long career based between Mexico and the United States. Um, I invite you to welcome our first speaker, Sandy Hidal. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me. I'm so happy uh, to be here and I'm really looking forward for the discussion after because I think that uh, this is what uh, normally uh, I, I don't like to go to lectures because it seems that I empty myself instead of, of uh, being able to discuss and I love when the, uh, the, the lecture is organized mainly around the uh, discussion rather than around us uh, trying to uh, you know, I share our uh, sort of the things that we don't have doubts about. But today, I mean, major uh, uh, thing that I would like to try to answer is a question that, I mean, we are learning more and more that we worked with it all the past uh, 15 years of our practice, which is uh, how, we go, how we look at the refugee issue and understand refugees beyond poverty and misery. And one of the potential uh, answers to this is to look where are the collective places that refugee, refugees manage to uh, create themselves. And they are mainly invisible for many reasons. The first reason is that refugees should not be seen beyond the possibility of sheltering them. Now, the whole humanitarian idea of sheltering uh, the refugees and, and uh, you know, to build shelters for them, to give them food, uh, to assist them. It's, it's completely something that is beyond acceptable. And I would like you to tell you a very tiny story, actually, that happened to me while working in Anirwa is as, as architects, normally we tend to, uh, we love maps, we do maps. And one of the things uh, mapping the Hesha refugee camp in Bethlehem, we put on the street, which is something that really exists, we put small uh, businesses you know, on the, some of the shops that went there. And when this arrived to the legal office of Anirwa, they literally freaked out. And they say, you know, legally, we cannot never put that there are businesses that are taking place inside the camps, even if this is informal. And why is this? Because UNRWA should, not UNRWA, also refugees, should maintain this mandatory of them being the poorest of the poor in order to be assisted. Now, how can you aid uh, people if they are not considered by everyone else as the ones that are in the need of, assist, of, of being aid and assisted in, in, uh, in, in their basic needs? No? Is that, you know, I, I spent sev almost seven years in, in my life in the corridors of the UN, and the basic thing that everybody was speaking about is basic needs. We cannot go beyond basic needs, because if we will go beyond basic needs, then there is no need for us to be here. And, you know, the whole struggle was how can we understand who are the poorest of the poor and all the standards and the projects and the, 
computer, uh, uh, you know, analysis, all about how can we understand who are the ones among the refugees that actually can get aid. So in a sense, the project that I would like to, to tell you uh, about or today is projects that would love to go beyond this image of poverty that oblige refugees themselves, actually, to still be uh, perceiving themselves and actually will uh, have the will to be perceived as uh, uh, an aid object, no? in, a, in a sense. And one of the things that really uh, happened many uh, years ago, I have to say in the case of, and here I, I would really speak about a very specific case of refugees that are in their refugee camp since 70 years. Means that they have almost three generation of refugees that born in refugee camps, raised in refugee camps, have life in refugee camps, and yet not able to say that they love their life in refugee camps. Meanwhile, they still want to defend their rights. I mean, the only thing that, the only uh, acceptable way to say, to, to speak about the camps, that the camps should disappear in order for the right of return to uh, actually happen. And of course, it's, uh, and I will tell you another very small story, so to explain where I want to head here. I mean, when uh, I would, first years, like almost 10 years ago, and it's still uh, the case, you would go to a place like Arubi refugee camp in the south of uh, the West Bank, and they have two very nice swimming pool no, in the camp. So, I mean, naively, really naively, I didn't have any tone of accusation. I asked them, why are you, uh, why did you build these uh, two nice swimming pools? And the answer was, they felt accused immediately, as if my question was already an accusation uh, question. And they say, we will destroy everything in order to come back home. They didn't answer me, you know, our kids have no access to the sea. We would like them to see the blue. We would like them to have a, a, a decent life. No, these were not the, the, the only answer I got in that moment is that we will destroy everything and come back home. And here, I mean, one major thing that I feel really happened is that refugees kept their life on hold in the narration, not in the practice. There is a very important distinction here. In the narration, refugees kept their life on hold in order for eventually messianic right of return to arrive. And then when you ask how this right of return will be practiced, I mean, who will be coming back, who will not be coming back, what will be happening to the camp, what will be happening to 70 uh, year of exile and life and Palestinian culture that was in refugee camp. I mean, major part of the Palestinian culture took place in refugee camps. What will be happening to all this culture? Where we were? And the only, unfortunately, I think, the only answer we have so far is that you know, by definition, camps should not exist. And I mean, I would completely agree on this. I'm not here saying that we should build refugee camps. I mean, refugee camps should not exist by definition. But then what does it mean, actually, to uh, dignify the life of exile? No? What does it mean to recognize this life of exile? And I would add even to give it value. No? How, how can we look at this life and be able to contribute into a narration that would recognize this life as a valuable life. I mean, one of our students in the university that we established in the refugee camp at a certain point was almost shouting and asking, do you want me to say that I love my life in a refugee camp? This is a total contradiction. Of course, it is a total contradiction. He, he says, I, I feel a bit uncomfortable to say, you know, I, I walk in the streets of, in the nice alleys of the camp in the night where everybody has his light in front of his house. My grandmother uh, is sitting in, uh, in front of the house. I walk and I feel myself completely part of this. Of course I love it, but it, is, it will be a contradiction for me to say I love a refugee camp. How can I put this together? No, what does it mean to put this together and say, yes, I mean, I, I am a person and my present matter for me and, and what I am, living right now has value and I cannot simply actually uh, deny it for a potential messianic future to come or to defend a right that actually pretend that I will be coming almost a farmer in the 48. How can 
you know, this be combined together. And also because, you know, even again in, in the camp where we are uh, working, uh, when we began to work with the students, everybody was claiming that he was a great farmer because his grandfather or grandmother were farmers and they became out of the villages. And literally we put four plants in the, uh, in the, in the place where we were uh, studying and teaching and nobody took care of these four plants and they died. And it was even a sort of, you know, we put them in front of the condition, if you want to be a farmer, take care of these four plants. And these four plants literally died and we took pictures of them and we documented this. And we decided that whoever of them will be speaking about him being a farmer should come back to these pictures and understand who and how he would give his life in exile a, a value, no, in, in that sense. And Actually, all what I was trying uh, to, um, to, to tell you or to, to I mean, the attempt to say is this is the Haitia refugee camp in the 50s and this is the Haitia refugee camp today. And I mean, 70 years passed by that one and this one. And in a sense, there is a very important passage that happens between that picture and uh, this picture. What really, I mean, when, when during especially the 50s, the beginning of the 50s, there was this uh, still very big hope of Palestinians to come back the day after to their home. And here, I mean, I'm not, I'm completely thinking what I'm trying to say is that there is a way of bringing the right of return again to the table and be able to speak practically about it. Because as long as we speak about it only as a messianic right to come one day when the people in the UN would sort of gather and give the Palestinian uh, people the right of return, I think that we can do much better before waiting this messianic moment. So I will try to tell you what we are trying uh, to do in, in, uh, in that sense. So what really happened is that when people began to replace the tent into a house, there was a very important historical Palestinian moment. No? And uh, they built the four walls, and then they arrived to the roof. And then when they wanted to actually uh, build the roof, there was a, a sort of uh, sort of open public discussion is that what does it mean to settle in the camp? And if people will see us already as, you know, as settling in the camp, and in that sense we use the word tautin or settlement, normalize, normalizing the camp and make it part of the city, we will certainly lose our ability to convince the world that we are still refugees. And again, back to how, how we convince the world that we are still refugees, by maintaining us to be poor and by maintaining our houses as a roofless houses. These are the two points that, you know, refugees and the world accept to look at the refugees and the refugees perceive themselves. So they wanted, Palestinian refugees wanted to maintain these two very strong images, being poor and being roofless. And in that sense, this was a sort of the, um, if I would put it this way, this was the strategical Palestinian move of all the time denying the camp as, 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 as a place and saying that, you know, at the end we are not building the camp and the camp can be destroyed very easily. And they, there is all the time the same sentence that everybody uses is that I will leave everything that I have and go back to my village to sit under the tree and to sleep under the tree. This is a very typical Palestinian way of speaking about the potential return. No, is that I am willing to leave everything and go under a tree. And in, in that sense, this was also the whole thing of not recognizing the roof of the camp. No, is is a, a way to say, you know, it, even if we built all this cement, still there is no roof in the camp. And therefore, because there is no roof, we can very easily, today, the day after, come back home. And in a sense, of course, this was a bit of, sorry, a bit of decision here not to build the roof and to actually not to recognize the camp as a place where there is a collective community with a very strong 
physical presence. They almost denied their physical presence by matter of fact as a political strategy. Now, if the world is able to recognize us only as ruthless and powerless, let's stick to this image. Otherwise, we are risking very highly to lose our status as refugees. So as a political, since the PLO to uh, until now, the refugees are still insisting, I mean, uh, that, that they would absolutely uh, sort of leave everything and come back home. And there, this, I, I believe this is making the, the right of return much more harder, even in the minds of Palestinians themselves. They arrive to the point that they don't believe themselves. So how can we return back to the fact that the right of return is something possible. And I think we can only do it if we will understand how the 70 year of exile can become part of this narration. And there are ways to do it. I mean, in, in that sense, to understand the right of return, for example, as a right of right of mobility that gives you the right as a Palestinian refugee to live in Jaffa and in Beirut, to be able to move between uh, uh, Tel Aviv and Damascus. And to have two houses, one in the camp, probably, and one in your village of origin. Nobody is obliging you to destroy your house in the camp. Why we have this self-imposition of not putting the camp and the exile as a major part of our narration. And we all the time tend to deny this exile for a potential messianic right of return. And I believe that this is what makes the right of return a messianic and almost an impossibility to think, because how can, how can we think about it today? And the issue that what I mean, I don't have time, unfortunately. What I want to tell you is I might take a lot of time, much more. So I, I would like to speak about you know, a major point, and this is not only happening with refugees, this happens with all the liberation uh, movements. For example, I am a woman, and when, whenever you speak about right of the women uh, in, in places under colonialism, and I heard this more than a time, is that now the most important thing is to liberate Palestine, and then eventually we will speak about the right of the women, we will speak about the right of the child, we will... And there is all the time this liberation agenda that actually uh, will not permit sort of daily rights that are very important uh, in, in, in that sense to emerge. And here, I mean, I would like to speak about certain refugee rights and what are the rights that we can understand from refugee camp. And, and one of the things is that, you know, the right to be visible as a collectivity that was all the time denied, not only to refugees, in that sense also to, uh, pal to Palestinians in general. You know, Israelis during the first intifada, there was a law that whenever there are more than four people in a, pub in, in, in a position like they are in the public, this would have been seen as the most dangerous thing to the Israeli occupation. And this would have been considered as something that they can take you to pr illegal, no illegal. And I mean, Israelis since 70 years, they were trying to kill any, and not Israelis. I think that this is belonging to all colonial Eras is that the first thing they target is collectivity, is that they kill collectivity wherever they can, because this is the only serious dangerous thing. And then they will uh, actually put you in a condition that you are an individual that needs to, and, and the more they manage to break you as uh, uh, collectivity, more they are able actually to control you. And I think that this is what is happening in refugee camps, is that they, there is an attempt to see them only as individuals to uh, sort of uh, uh, needs of an aid, while refugee camps in a place like the West Bank are one of the most strong yet that still exist collectivity in a place like Palestine. And we cannot avoid not to see it. It's very important to understand this collective di dimension of the camp and this what will take us to understand the camp beyond poverty, according to, I mean, to our practice. And here I would like to take you to one of the 
projects. We spoke about the roofless. Oh my gosh. Okay, I, I mean, I will try. I mean, I wanted to speak about majorly uh, three projects. You know, that we did in refugee camps. I have five minutes, and I will speak one minute and a half about each one of them, and then we search, but I needed this introduction. The problem is that without this introduction, we cannot understand these three projects. One is the project of a piazza in uh, Fawar refugee camp. This was the first time that uh, any piazza was actually designed and built in a refugee camp. And as soon as we spoke about the piazza, the reaction was this is a, absolutely a threat of normalization. It's we didn't accept at the beginning the roofless. We, we wanted our house to be roofless. And now we are even speaking about the manifestation of a collective place. And they were completely against it at the beginning. But there was a whole struggle in uh, in the camp between our rights actually to have to be a collectivity to be able to have our uh, own spaces to be to have and this was required mainly by uh, women and then this create i mean we we built uh, we designed this uh, plaza and very strangely it was a long very long almost seven year participatory uh, processes where at the end of the day each one of the uh, refugees have a wall that comes out of the uh, of in front of his house that creates a sort of a very big roofless house in uh, many ways. It's just, and and what they say is that we are in a place. Refugee camps are places where you have no private and you bub, no public. So this is a very important for you to know. People don't have the they don't own legally their houses. They have only the use uh, the the right to use them. And ANERWA is very uh, uh, clearly says we don't administrate refugee camps. We are not the public in refugee camps. We only provide services. So how can you manage a public space in a place where you don't have public, first of all? And how can you understand the private in a place where you don't have private? And this place was a sort of a combination between the public and the private, because people say that if we don't have any public that can take responsibility of this, if we will build a house, a sort of a house, that each one will do the action of entering it and getting out of it, then each one that will get inside this house will take his own responsibility with him, and we will tell him, why did you enter if you don't want to hear kids uh, uh, shouting, or if you want, don't want the football to hit you. Or So you have, as a person, you take your uh, uh, responsibility, get inside this place, this roofless house, and this idea of making it a combination and overlapping between the public and the private is a way for it to exist. So again, we are speaking about this idea of the ruthlessness manifested in the uh, public, in the uh, piazza. And actually, not by chance, what really happened now is that there is a right, uh, uh, there is a movement of women <coughs> in Fawar refugee camp, one of the south of Hebron, one of the most conservative places in Palestine, requiring their right to be in the public in this plaza. And they are doing a lot of activities, yoga, running. I mean, in a place that at the beginning, eight years ago, when we arrived there to speak about a potentiality of the women being there, I mean, there was a complete no, even from the women themselves, even to go out for a coffee in the plaza. They say this is not part of our culture. And here again back is what is it? It's not part of our culture. In the villages, everybody was sitting out all together and drinking coffee and tea. And at a certain point, it doesn't become part of your culture. But then when you ask them, then what is happening in this place? And they tell you there is a space where we can do this. And here again, I mean, what is it? How can we bring the right of the women today and now? And not to have, in that sense, even the right of return almost preventing you know, that it's, it's all about liberation. How can we still be speaking about the right of the woman to, to, to be in the public, the right of the refugee to be recognized in the public, the right of the refugee to be a public figure, the right of refugee to be a political public figure, is where we will be bringing back the right of return to the heart of the question. And it's not by saying, you know, we deny exile. So in that sense, uh, and the other two projects that I will not be speaking about because it's, uh, but I will only mentioning them, is uh, a design of a school in Shafat refugee camp. And the whole idea was about are we beautifying the camp or are we giving our kids the right to learn decently and the, the right to have a place where they are proud of and living in. And there was a whole, 
years of sort of uh, uh, participation with the community and with the teachers and with the students and with UNRWA itself, because this was the first school that was designed by UNRWA, where at a certain point I would receive uh, emails of accusation from colleagues from UNRWA asking me if I am doing a wonderland for refugees and what does that mean and what is the meaning of designing and bringing formal design into refugee camps. And again, it's about this question of what does it mean to, to recognize refugee camps and how can we actually take further this uh, that I was uh, speaking about. I, will, I mean, there is a whole... Uh, thing about this school, but that I cannot touch. And then the third uh, uh, architect, I mean, project is this, um, the university campus in camps, the university that we established in uh, the Haitian refugee camp. And we felt, you know, after all these years of working, is that there are a lot, as I said, you know, by narration, we speak about something, and by practice, there is complete something else that is happening on the ground in refugee camps. And as soon as we arrived to refugee camps, we felt that we needed a voca vocabulary, you know, as if while walking, there were a lot of things that were happening around us that we were unable to give names and to... Uh, so we established this university in uh, the Haitian refugee camp where we began to speak about this contradiction no, of how the whole idea of how to recognize the camp as still a temporary uh, a place, but from which to actually be able to defend certain rights and to defend today uh, certain rights. And then when we were asked as architects to sort of think about a place where this university might, you know, as these <coughs> amazing places where we are here in Brown, and as, as architects, we thought that the only place where that can manifest what is happening in campusing camps is a concrete tent. And it's explaining this image of the tent that was in the 48 and the whole concrete that was built and the whole contradiction. And when you come in front of such a concrete tent in the Haitian refugee camp, you would sort of question why a concrete tent. And this is the whole question that we wanted to come out with and to try to answer why a concrete tent today in the Haitian refugee camp. And thank you very much. the screen here. Hello, I'm Khalid, I'm late, and I'm here. Um, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'll just dive right into it, I think. Um, so what I want to present today is a bunch of projects that I've done with some uh, friends of mine, and I'm part of a collective called the Sajid Collective, and um, I'm an architect by training, and there's another architect, and there's an artist, and a graphic designer, illustrator. And the kind of work we do is work that mostly happens related to the current Arab condition in general, um, but maybe with a specific focus on Syria because of sort of like how big that is in the world today. And um, what I wanted to show you is basically a project that I have nothing to do with, which I found online. And it's a windmill made, out, it's a water wheel, sorry, made out of metal scrap uh, built in the Ruta, which is, um, what used to be the agricultural field surrounding the city of Damascus until 2011, probably a population of two, two and a half million people, everything from agricultural to like informal to suburban. And uh, now is one of the 
now the population's dropped to maybe 300,000. This is the site of this infamous chemical attack from two years ago. Uh, this is the site of some of the heaviest fighting that you see. A lot of people talk about eastern Aleppo. The population stuck here is, is, in, a ver is in a very similar, if not more dire, situation. And so um, I wanted to share this project with you. And um, then this other project that sort of somehow comes out of it, which is um, this project called Current Power in Syria, which, um, which I did with Sijil. And uh, this is a project that um, somehow looks at the way in which electricity is used as a nation-building device across the last 100 years of Syria. And uh, I'm very interested in I'm very interested in how, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, I'm very interested in the relationship between not only how, how the state or those in power sort of like produce a vision of electricity or infrastructure, but also how that's resisted. Electricity being something that's completely invisible, but then it manifests itself in, uh, in appliances, infrastructure, but also practitioners who actually understand how it works. And then, a quick jump into this project called Excavating the Sky, which is a project about the role of the airplane in producing the landscape of Syria across the last hundred years. And then finally, uh, this mirror project, which is uh, called uh, The Revolution is a Mirror. So the video. So this is a video that is made by uh, Yassine al Bouti. So uh, maybe by way of introduction. Um, I'd moved to New York in 2013, 14. And uh, very soon after I did this project in Venice, uh, the Excavating the Sky project, and um, sitting in the Upper East Side in this wonderful building that is giving me money to become a PhD student, um, I, I met Yassine online. I saw this photograph, the one that I showed you, and um, I was very moved by it. And I found out who the photographer was. It was published by Reuters. And it was a boy called Yassine Ibushi, who's 25 years old. I'm very proud to say that we are now good friends because we've had this relationship for this time. But Yassine basically uh, got stuck in Arbin, which is one of the Ruta villages, and uh, was unable to go to school. And as a way to kind of support his family, he began to use uh, his camera to sort of document the life and death of everything happening around him. And he, it, he slowly got picked up by different news agencies, including Reuters, but also Anadolu Agency, which is the Turkish press. And so um, I think the video will speak for itself. There's very little dialogue. Those who don't speak Arabic, I could, does anyone not speak Arabic? You all embarrass me. Um, uh, there's very little dialogue. I'll do a quick translation of the dialogue. but. رب العالمين ساوينا هي العنفة كان شجع العالم يساوى عنفات يستثمر طاقة الكهرباء العنفة عم يدور خمس دورات بالدقيقة عملنا طريقة دون عند الناجي تسريع بطارات مسننات لحتى ساوينا ستين دورة هون بالدقيقة هي البطارة بدون ستين دورة بالدقيقة ترجع عاد تنقل لهون السرعة لحتى بتصير ألف مية دورة تقريبا
He's basically explaining how the electricity is being distributed across uh, multiple houses and businesses in this, in this part of the village. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty self-explanatory, so let's go back to it. So, um, so basically, I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between fundamentally, like, this is a, is this a, anyway, knowledge and power, really. And I'm also interested in the relationship with uh, in particular forms of knowledge and how that produces particular types of power, namely th those of performance and uh, poetry. Um, of course, I know Sandy's work for many, many, many years, and I agree with almost everything that she said, but I'm also young enough to be naive enough to still demand the impossible to want what is possible, and so, uh, which we probably agree on as well. And so uh, I'm interested in sort of also conferring that kind of demand onto the spaces itself that we are talking about. And so this is um, this process of alchemy that is happening now in Narbin. So um, you all know, so you don't know. Basically, the, this area has been under siege for like since 2012. And uh, every, what you hear about on the news is how it's been sort of like cut off from people are not allowed to enter or exit, medical supplies, food, etc. So it's become quite sustainable in itself. And uh, what was rarely actually talked about is that the state actually cut off the electricity from, from this population. And so 80% of the population of the electricity of all power, including gasoline for cars, etc., comes from this very strange technique where you they collect plastic from rubble or from garbage, and then they smelt it in these very primitive um, incinerators, furnaces, furnaces, and then when they and then they capture the fumes that are leaving this these very toxic fumes, of course, and they realize that if they capture the fume at a particular temperature you can get a substance that is not gasoline, but is actually can work a gasoline engine. And at a different temperature, you can get something that's very similar to diesel. And so this is 80% of people's energy needs. And so you have people like Abu Ali, who is the, who is the blacksmith, who was sick and tired of this. And he decided that he could actually produce a windmill, uh, a water wheel using the metal scrap. As you can see, it's all arch architectural scrap. Like this one's made out of old, um, water tanks uh, that is somehow collected and then using that scrap to produce this marvelous machine. Um, when I saw this image, I was like, oh my god, we need to somehow find a way to make more of these. And I met Yassine, and Yassine introduced me to Abu Ali. But by the time, and my whole thing was I could actually get money from different art agencies who might be interested in doing like a sculpture type project in Syria. And so you sell it Whichever way you want to sell it as a humanitarian project, I'm ready to do that. You want to sell it as sculpture, I'm fine. Architecture, wonderful. And so fundamentally, just trying to get the money into Syria, into the hands of people like Abu Ali and Yassin. And so, um, um, so but this took so long that by the time I actually had the sum, there was 40 or so of these water wheels, ranging in diameter from 60 centimeters to four and a half meters that were sort of like dispersed throughout the landscape. These used to be, it probably should be said that these used to be agricultural canals that are now mostly open sewage. Um, yeah, just a food for thought, really. Just think about the waste floating around and how that waste is being transformed into people's livelihood. Um, I'm also interested in sort of like thinking about this in relationship, because I'm pretending to be an Islamic art historian, in a relationship to sort of like a longer history of the marvelous and the actual use of automata and what kind of life can be produced from that kind of automata. Um, there's also a, a local history to this, which is this, this is a, a noria that's in the same landscape of the Ghuta, 
Um, these disappeared in the mid-50s. As far as I know, this is the only photograph that exists of one, of this Iraqi architect who was visiting Damascus. And then the more famous norias, obviously, are the norias of Hama, the central Syrian city, which are a national symbol, et cetera, et cetera, here on this banknote that I used growing up. That uh, Hama, of course, is infamous today for the massacre that happened there in the 80s, uh, where tens of thousands of people died, a number that we thought was very large before the monstrous regime became what it became. But fundamentally, as part of the commemoration of the Hama massacre, uh, in 2012, uh, what activists did is they actually threw some red, some red paint onto the Noria. Uh, model Norias were carried around in protests throughout the city, throughout the country. And um, yeah, th there's a Noria that supposedly was burnt down by drunken soldiers. These are very, very old. So they Roman origin, but mostly medieval construction at this point, so 12th, 13th century. There's one that's been supposedly been burnt down by some drunken soldiers. There's one just outside of Hama that was actually disassembled, probably coming to a museum near you soon. And uh, this we've already talked about. And so in this discussion with, uh, with Abu Ali and Yassin, it was decided that maybe what we will actually do is build a windmill rather than a noria. Almost using the money that I'd collected as some kind of like seed fund for a research and development phase, using a very similar technology to the one that we saw already, but also made out of metal scrap, and uh, in the hope that it would work, and then eventually sort of begin to perpetuate throughout the landscape. The advantages, obviously, of a windmill is that you could build them further away from, from the water. Uh, we found a public program that is actually using this electricity, so on and so forth. And then we took this to Marrakesh. Um, I'll sort of skip through this very quickly, but this is this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place, again, I shared this space with Sandy. She was upstairs. Uh, we were on the ground floor. Uh, but you have to imagine this beautiful garden, basically. And that's the Atlas Mountains in the back. And uh, you have a single axis that stretches basically 60, 70 kilometers, sort of like just one straight line, and somehow ends with this pleasure palace where the gentleman who built this would kill people after dining and winding them. Anyway, you sort of dumped them into the water. But um, so we built this project here. Uh, it's like a quick walk through through it. We actually cut the axes with this architectural object, sort of like trying to produce this kind of new barrier within the space itself. And it's an object that sort of reorients how the space works. Um, this is turning around it, turning around again. On one side, there was a drawing made up of all these windmill elements. And on the other side, there was a collection of books, um, which you're welcome to look at, but I'll also show you a little bit of. So this is the Project Current Power in Syria. How much time do I have? Perfect. So this is Current Power in Syria. I'm, uh, this is a map of Syria in 2011 and 2013, showing that the 87, I think, percent decrease in electricity between. So for those who don't know the map, this is the Euphrates. <laughs> That's Raqqa. This is Aleppo. Um, and then the story was, t the books were divided into five chapters one chapter for every electrical infrastructure. The first one is Telegraph. And uh, it tells the story of the Ottoman Telegraph, basically the first electrical infrastructure in our part of the world, and how this, uh, this particular sultan decided to sort of just like, you know, I'm everywhere because I have this crackling wire, basically. And um, it tells a story, a true story that's in the archive of, um, of a sheikh in Salt, which is now North Jordan who wakes up one day, and he's the sheikh of the village, of, or of Salt. Is anyone here from Salt? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I, I kind of worried about it. Um, anyway, Salt, a wonderful, wonderful town. But, um, <coughs> but so he was the sheikh of Salt, and so he, he asked them to explain, he, the religious sheikh, like the, the clergyman, and he asked them to explain to him what was this, that it was just open, and they told him it was a telegraph office, they explained to him how it works, and so he proceeded to every single morning send his dream to the sultan. It sounds like a Borges story, that's because Borges gets these stories from places like this, and fundamentally, uh, we only really know about this is because one dream he had was an assassination attempt, Then every single bureaucrat, Ottoman bureaucrat soldier between Istanbul and Salt was sort of mobilized to get to the bottom of this story. So this is the, the first story. This is Salt, turn of the century. Um, the second story is Tramway. 
tramway tells a story of in 1928 of a tram strike in Damascus. Uh, the, the, the change of the price for the tram ticket led to, uh, led to first a strike, uh, uh, a boycotting of the tram infrastructure that then turned into a general strike that covered the entirety of Syria, but then eventually also parts of Iraq, Palestine, Lebanon, and Egypt. And this is a major, this is a major challenge to the French mandate. And uh, this is the, firm, the famous 40-day strike, 60, 40, I, it's very famous, I can't remember how many days, 40-day uh, strike. But what's interesting about the strike is that it uh, forced the French to actually negotiate independence of Syria. And uh, the, the actual delegation went to Paris, but that's, and then they reached a certain agreement, the so-called alliance of friendship between the French people and Syrians. But um, Hitler kind of rolled into Paris soon after, and that was postponed until after the war. Uh, but really, it's a, but it's very familiar. This kind of like popular uprising to produce demands. Like we're interested, in sort of like looking at sort of like previous moments from our history and trying to sort of like gain certain insight into what works and what doesn't. But also the potential that potentially has been lost that has never really been fully realized. Um, last, the third story is the story of the dam. Uh, it's the story of um, the Euphrates Dam, which is the biggest infrastructure project in Syria. Uh, told through the eyes of Omar Amir Lai, the late filmmaker, who in 1970 makes a film celebrating the dam as some kind of uh, celebration of socialism. And then in 2006, I believe, he, um, he makes a second film called The Flood, which some of you might have seen, which The Flood in Bath Country, where he somehow understands the danger of this kind of project that he potentially participated in the first time around. And so it's a wonderful, wonderful lesson for all of us. Um, and then the fourth story is a story of torture and the use of torture, it, electricity in torture, and how that produces a particular type of citizen in Syria. And because it's a particular heavy subject, we tell it through the eyes of Rawar, who's a famous, who's a famous comedian. So in 1978, there's a there's a play called Cheers O Nation, Kasa Kiawatan by Muhammad Magut, and in which Rawar is tortured on stage by, uh, by a Secret Service person and his assistant, like an officer and his assistant. And every time they try to, they waterboard him or something happens, he somehow manages to resist. And, uh, and the, the whole theater erupts. You have to imagine like a Charlie Chaplin like character, for those who don't know him, and on, on stage. And then finally, uh, because he's managed to subvert everything, subvert everything he, they bring out the electricity, the most fierce on the wall, they stick a cable up his backside, and then he starts laughing. And, uh, and then so the officer asks him to explain himself, and he tells him, like, oh, sir, I'm very, very sorry, but electricity has arrived into my asshole before it arrived into our village. And so uh, that is kind of what, this is the scene itself. And this is the infamous Sednaya prison. This is a text by uh, Munif that talks about the body sort of accepting the electricity, almost like a mystical experience. I'm sorry, I'm just rushing through this. And then the windmill, the fifth story, is our own sort of participation and trying to imagine what kind of nation, an impossible one, one that is not within the current borders of Syria, obviously, uh, would, uh, would look like, and what is the role of such infrastructure might be. And so th this is Abu Ali and uh, Yassin is kind of cropped off. He took wonderful, wonderful photographs that unfortunately we weren't able to use as well as we would have liked to. But this is this plastic uh, process that I was, just, I was describing to you earlier, the smelting. Um, yeah. That's how gas is being sold on the streets in those little bottles. As we've seen, the building of the windmill the erection of the windmill. It's kind of hidden in plain sight. It's now survived quite a lot of Russian bombing and two winters, so we're quite proud of it. Um, it's still there. Um, yeah, I think I'll stop here. Thank you very, very, very much. Are you serious? Yes, um, yeah, of course.
Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Marcos Ramirez. Like I mentioned, I'm coming from Tijuana, and I'm going to show you a lot of images. We ready, like, to see, and uh, like, I'm, I pack a lot of information into the presentation. I hope I can uh, talk about all of them. Um, if I cannot explain all of them perfectly, then we can come back and talk about them. I'm a, a migrant. I've been a migrant for the last 50,000 years, and I'm going to talk about that. We're going to start with a DNA um, uh, test that I took like six months ago, or m maybe a little bit more. And then uh, after making a project that, I, that, is going to, that is going to be the last one that I'm going to show you, that is called the limitations. And, uh, and so the, the test uh, brought me uh, some information, which is the... How you click with this? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is it going back or forward? Or from left, right. Okay. So this is going back. Yeah. Okay. So I took the test and I kind of knew or expected some composition in, in the test. I'm Mexican and so I'm a, a really uh, a mestizo and with a complex uh, uh, background, but uh, still I was kind of surprised of some of the the elements. So I came out being uh, 61.9 European, 29.4. You can see all the the, the the different components that I have in myself, and uh, it was very interesting to me to see that uh, I had um, uh, Native American blood, but not from the place that I was expecting to have it. Uh, uh, being Mexican, I expected to have like more like a Aztec blood or, or Zapotec blood or whatever, and it ended up having 25% a, a uh, of, of uh, Native American blood related more to the, to the uh, people from the Navajo Nation or the Apache Nation in the United States. So I'm going to present you here the trip that my parents did to get to the place I live right now. So my mom's uh, uh, DNA, it's a A, which it comes from uh, the north part of Asia through the, the Strait of Bering into the Americas for the last 12,000 years around. And uh, originally, uh, her branch or her, her DNA comes from 50,000 years ago from the heart of Africa, coming across uh, Asia, going to Bering Strait and coming down to the, to the Americas. In the other hand, my father, which is J1, it's from the area that, we'll, that we were talking about just recently, just now, which is uh, in the Middle East. And then supposedly the way I trace it and the way they mark it, he traveled from there to the northern part of Africa and somehow is sneaking to Europe. I don't know how many years ago, maybe thousand, I don't know. And then I got another mix there. And then it eventually, like, I don't know, between 400 years to 300 years to 100 years, well, not 100, but 200, he uh, took a boat, jumped in a boat and came to the Americas. So. That's my mom's journey. That's uh, her A haplogroup. And that, that's the connection uh, with uh, America. And then that also mentioned that there's people with the A haplogroup uh, registered that have been in California for the last 10,000 years or, or 10,000 years ago. This is going to be interesting at the end when I present the other, the other project. And, uh, and then, uh, so she arrived or her family or her line arrives to the center part of Mexico and my father arrived later. So it took 50,000 years to meet each other in this very remote place. And when they arrived there uh, to this small town where our families have been for the last 200 years at least, they don't know each other because my father left when he was 14 from that small town to California. And my mom is six years younger than her. So they end up meeting where I was born in Tijuana, California, Mexico, border with San Diego, California, 
in the place that is the new division between the North and the South, in Latin America and the United States. And this is the composition of the, of the nations before the maps that we, all know, that we know now. This is the Mexican Empire, because it existed at a point, the Mexican Empire. Uh, this is another uh, information uh, of migrants in the other way, like before we were uh, the migrants, well, a lot of uh, white folks were migrating into Mexico during the colony. This is the actual border. I live in this very corner next to California. And this is now the, the, the Mexican origin population in the U.S., which is uh, very threatened for the current administration, supposedly. This is the small town in Jalisco, Mexico, the, 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 the west, central west of Mexico, where they where they uh, were born, both of them. This is, is uh, an image of the, of the town. This is the old Tijuana, which was previous to Las Vegas, the sin city of the world. And we uh, keep working on improving so we can claim that, that, that place again. That's on, on, the, on your right, that's my father and my mom. And these other two are my uncles. They were married at the same time, so two cousins against two cousins. Since it was the same family, they decided to make the double wedding and then you will save some money. And this is uh, the fence that does exist, at least in part, between uh, Mexico and the United States. This is my neighborhood, the Colonia Libertad, and that's San Isidro, California. This is another take on the same uh, place. And this is how it looks, part of the fence that Mr. Tom so eagerly wants to build. Again, that is already there. And we even have this fence pretending to cut or divide the ocean, which I think is really off. Well, I was born and raised in Tijuana, Baja California, Mexico. My parents, both of them, were uh, presidents of the United States when I was born. And they decided to have me be born in Mexico because they wanted me to be full-blooded Mexican, born and raised there, which I, at a point in my life, didn't agree much but I'm really very proud of their decision, and I respect it perfectly. I went to school in Mexico, graduated as a lawyer, and then uh, eventually before claiming back, because I had a green card for a certain amount of my life, up to from zero years when, when I was just born, four days after, to when I was 14, I had a green card. And then my father gave it back when he was threatened that if, uh, if we don't come to the United States, we will lose our rights. He, my father gave our papers, and he kept uh, his paper to be able to work and commute. But uh, then uh, uh, I had to, like, when I became an adult, to, to try to get back that, uh, that uh, possibility of having a residence in the United States. And he helped me out in a, in a way. But I was an uh, illegal alien for a while. After graduating, I really was really not uh, happy with the sit political situation in my country and all the corruption in my country. So I decided to quit, and I decided to come to the United States and start working in something else. And so I started working as an illegal alien for a little bit, like for three years. I still have some like uh, uh, notes whenever I cross the border that they know me being an illegal before having back, because I got back my residence eventually. But I worked, as they mentioned, for 17 years in the construction business. And for those 17 years, uh, at least 10 of them, I was combining with art practice. But it, it is until I do this project, I did this project, uh, Century 21, in, in, which, in which I was able to connect or put together the three parts of my personality, very crazy personality, of being trained as a lawyer and uh, worked for many years in construction and then wanted to become an artist and do the projects that I like. So I did this, this project for an event that's called Insight. And what I did is uh, this Chuck house, this house like the ones that you saw when I show you the, the image between U.S. and Mexico. Those, there's a lot of uh, improvised constructions around the, the city. And the event wanted to like put Tijuana and San Diego on the same level and show Tijuana only the nice, well-developed places for the, art, uh, for the public art uh, exhibition. And uh, what I did, I uh, brought or replicated a, a, a house from the neighborhoods that nobody was going to be taken to. So 
Uh, I put it right outside the museum, the main museum in Tijuana, which is called the Centro Cultural Tijuana, and I named it Century 21. And I had uh, the plans, uh, architectural plans and permits to build the piece, the, the, the house, which mean, meant that I went and I applied for, for the permits, and I even had to bribe people saying, uh, okay, well, see, we don't need to go to the place, it's gonna be far away, but uh, to make it easier, like I'll give you like 20 bucks and, and then you give me the permits or whatever. So I got the permits and the permits were, were allowing me to build the house in a federal zone in a museum. So it put in evidence that uh, the, the, the corruption of the, of the city and the government when we opened the, the exhibition because everything was stamped and signed and everything. So the, the, the house was a, a livable quarter. You could, like, they had a food at the beginning, water and everything was very clean, and people could enter the, the piece for three months and do whatever they wanted to do in it. This is another, uh, uh, I had like four panels outside with real homes and then some drawings uh, basically, the drawing, the, the, the bottom one is an architectural drawing, and the one in the center is a, a pencil graphite drawing over a black uh, sheet of paper. And it's the, the different perceptions that people have about those homes. So there's people that are, see it like in Technicolor, like me with color. When I see that, it, for me, it's shocking, and I observe, and I wanted to do something about it. But there's other class of people in, in Tijuana that is, they act like it's, they don't exist. So the image, the same image is in the paper, but you have to work harder in order to find it. So uh, these project posters from the edge is something that I did like, uh, like 20 years after, or 15 years after the, the other uh, project. And what I did is I just gathered all the photographs that I took uh, from the city. Uh, and and I didn't, since I'm not a photographer, I didn't know what, what to do with them. So, but I wanted to bring them out. So I selected like 25 of them, and then I went out and asked people to uh, feel me a postcard or whatever they feel about the city. So they, uh, I choose people from all over, and then a couple of people that I know also, and they started reacting to the images. And then, uh, and then I placed that information in the front. So some people like uh, forgot about the image, and they, they just expressed their need to communicate, and, and then they, they finally had the opportunity to send a potential postcard to someone they love that they never take the time to do. Uh, so this is a series, these are a series of, of peculiar uh, images around the city and, uh, and the, how people feel them, and they became pieces. You know? That's my father uh, writing, and that's, he selected this because it looks like the house that he inhabited when he arrived to Tijuana originally. So those are, this is a, a very famous Mexican restaurant in Tijuana, it's called El Sombrero. Tijuana is a very weird city because like uh, the, the government and, and in order to try to uh, really sustain the idea of nationality and identity started doing all these weird monuments and, and things to like, to, for us to like really believe that we are Mexicans and so that, that could be one of the anchors for them. And some other images like this, this is a house made out of doors with no door. And, and the city, it, it was uh, for a long time uh, accepting or taking all the trash from the United States. So uh, from, it's very different from other shanty towns and all over the world because the access of, to, to materials that were discarded in the U.S., they were being able to be used in Tijuana. So it's not the case anymore because the government now forbids to cross this uh, garbage into Mexico, but there's still a lot of uh, places like that, a lot of, a lot of uh, homes made with a, a garage door uh, walls and stuff like that. So this is the way I place them. And then uh, eventually, like uh, 20 years after, a creator wanted to do a show on inside and all of the installations, she invited me to do another version of this, so take on my project 20 years after. And she wanted me to do it in a, in a, in a central part of Mexico, in a, in a place that's called, uh, it's amazingly beautiful, and, and it's called Cuernavaca, Mexico, the, the city of the eternal spring. And, and she wanted to, she asked me, why don't you do something about the other house? And I said, well, this is a, I'm gonna have to do something completely different because it's a different uh, place, and it's not a, uh, the same story, and it's too many years ago. So, 
uh, there's this museum with an open plaza as well, and uh, and I uh, accepted the the idea of making a, uh, the project, and it was only six thousand dollars to make a project, uh, and uh, when I say only, is because what I attempted uh, to do, which translated into sixty thousand pesos. So I uh, I, I uh, invited four guys to help me out to do my project, which I titled La Huella, The Footprint, and we decided to make uh, a house cropping the perimeter of the house that I did 20 years before, including the bathroom, the outhouse. And, uh, and I said to them, we're going to make this piece out of brick, because brick is the material that you use here, mainly in that area. People make parts of the homes, only like, like the walls. They try to include the roof because they they're living they're not living in a in a refugee camp but in, in their own environment in their own place, but uh, they they keep it to the elemental and always they leave like a a preparation for the second story or something that that eventually they w are going to build that almost never happen you know, but I said okay let's 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 try to make make a house with these five thousand dollars, and 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 uh, and so they agree, but. What I decided is that uh, I, I told them, what about if I pay you California wages for your work, for this project? And instead of paying you like uh, $3, 70 pesos a day, I pay you nine twenty five for you and seven fifty for you, the helpers. And then we're going to make the house. The house is, the project, our project is done whenever we run out of money. And so, because I couldn't like sacrifice their work and their <coughs> wages for me to look very good with a very beautiful piece outside a museum. So this is the new version that was called La Huella, and these are some of the images of that project. We had like a, a week and a half to do uh, the project, and I actually told them like, uh, you're gonna make like a Ten times more each day. I'm only expecting you to work twice as hard as you usually do, <laughs> and I think they work harder than that. And uh, so we we work every day. We went to the bar every day. We had a great time, and uh, this is the result. We had no roof. What a coincidence! <laughs> <laughs> but these guys were uh, lucky. Well, to to wrap up the project, I asked Innocencio, which is this guy here. At the beginning, do you like to keep the house? Obviously, I cannot give you the lot, the, 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 the piece of land, because it's not mine. But if we put less concrete in the mix, maybe you will be able in your, in your own time to clean the bricks and put together something for you in the terrain or the little lot that you have in the hills. He says, I'll keep it. OK, so we're going to make an agreement. I'm not going to be here. We're not, we're not going to have left money left. So you're going to have to take down the house with the help of your friends. You're going to have to retrieve everything, and I'm going to pay the truck to take it to your, your uh, place. And then you're going to be so kind that you're going to replace all these papers that we saved and then, and then cover and put it the way it was. That's why the title of the piece is La Huella, because the only thing that you can find there is this like sort of watermark that it shows you where the foundation of that house is still buried. That is the old uh, David Alfaro Siqueiros uh, studio in Cuernavaca, Mexico, one of the three uh, major muralists of the Mexican art history. Well, this is another, another piece that I show in the Fisher Gallery, and it's a, a piece that's called Walls. It's two parallel walls uh, installation, one made out of bricks and one made out of uh, uh, wood, and it has the uh, two videos taking one, in this case, this one. Uh, it's uh, eight minutes of video from Mexican uh, workers making a house in San Diego, California. And this other one is a video, eight hours reduced to eight minutes, Mexican workers making a house in, in Rosarito, Mexico. So you can see from the two, the two places how the, the, the clothing, the tools, and all of that changes 
in, in, the two, in the two places. The only thing that remains the same is the music. But like uh, in, in Mexico, uh, there's more than, it's eight hours, but it's more than that because the, the, the eating period is like an hour and a half and everybody brings their food and cooks and put a, a, put a, fi a fire. And once you throw the food over there, you, can, you are invited to share and, 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 and then pick up a burrito from the other guy, whatever. You know? And everybody seems happy. And on the other side, you see nice and very uh, modern tools and nice cars and well-dressed and everything, but everything is so rushed and everybody has to eat wrap, wrap, uh, in plastic food that uh, has to be consumed in uh, 25 minutes because you have to go back to work and everything is noisy, uh, compressors and everything is super fast. So it changes a lot. It's the same group of people that are with a different I don't know, rhythm. So that's what you can see in, in that piece. In 1996, so we're not respecting the, the time, well, your time, yes, but not the time uh, and, or, the, or the years. This is 1996, it's the second project that I did. Uh, right after I did the, the house, I, uh, it took me like two years to make the project in, and I did this uh, based on a, on a now, it's, it's a long time. In 1996, we had a, the first threat to the Latin American, to the, to the Latino community, because the uh, governor, Pete Wilson, submitted a, a project that was called Project Proposal 187 to limit the rights of migrants in the state of California. And he wanted like, uh, to really, to really um, uh, take away uh, citizenship for the sons of migrants, stuff like that. So what I did, since the title was 187, I, I just took 187 photographs of one, 187 different people doing 187 different jobs. And then I placed them all on these metal plates around a container that represents California. And these are the photos of, of the people, only the hands, no, no faces. And they were all placed in the bottom like if they were tombstones or something like that. So I had from Carlos Santana to uh, people working on the fields or doing constructions. It was kind of hard because after 100, you have to like really try to find out another 87 different jobs and, and you have to like really uh, work it out. So I had to go back and work in construction for a while to be in order to be able to make it and explore the city. And, and I'm just so happy that the, the project was not titled uh, proposition 2000 because it would have been impossible to accomplish. But uh, the container had these very w weirdly located openings that were the same size of the metal plates, very tall or very bottom, uh, or in the bottom, and you could see inside, and there were four sculptures made with things that uh, the migrants uh, uh, work in, you know, like uh, agricultural or, or uh, uh, maquiladoras or construction work, whatever. And then I had this. Uh, a desk with a, a book when I had a register of all the people that I interviewed and I asked them uh, if I could take their photograph. So I had the, the register slip had with their handwriting, their name, the age, place of birth, and the kind of work that they do, the date of entrance in the United States and the migratory status that they hold. And a lot of them lied to me and I knew that because they were afraid to me, of me I mean. Uh, because they, they were not completely sure that where I was coming from, if, if I was a, a, an artist or not. Uh, and, uh, but I kept that uh, information. And this is, this is something that has to do with my training as a lawyer, I guess, because what, it, it took me a while to realize that what I did is an of offering of proof by having 187 photos of actual people and then having them sign their information not a information that can be harmful for, for them, but it could be helpful for the case that we were presenting. Then in 2000, I was invited to the Whitney Biennial in, in New York, and then uh, Mike the Curator selected this, uh, this piece uh, uh, that is, I called Stripes and Fence Forever, an homage to Jasper Jones, and it's a, like a replica of the, the, the fence that divides Tijuana and San Diego, Mexico, and the United States in the form of a U.S. flag. And it's dividing two sections of a square diagonally. In the front, we have a brick, a couple of brick walls. And in the back is a, a couple of uh, cinder concrete uh, blocks. So it's the same uh, land, but just artificially divided by this fence. That from one side, from the back looks like a fence, but from the front looks 
like an offense. So I took also in the Mexican flag, but, uh, since we only have five minutes, four now, I'm, I'm going to skip this. No water. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump since I have five minutes. I'm gonna go directly to the last, to the one. This is important, I guess. This is my most uh, known piece. It's called Toy and Horse. And it was placed in the border between Mexico and the United States. Thank you. In 1997, it's 10 meter high. And actually the, the, the gate of entrance is f like 50 meters into the US. So the officers can come out and uh, like register your car and go with the dogs and then uh, like uh, detain whomever they want to. And the real border is where the, the horse is located. So that, that, that line in the bottom is, in the plate, is the demarcation between the two countries. It had two heads, and it was talking about this relationship between the two countries and, uh, and that it is almost impossible to, be, to divide and to separate even with the worst intentions of some people that we know who they are. <laughs> so here's another, uh, this is a different one, but it's very similar in Spain. This is, I will not go much into that, but this is the road between LA and Mexico City. And it deals with this uh, transit of, of my people and my DNA. And this, this in a way shows how people came down. My, my people came down from the north of the United States into the Valle de Anahuac in Mexico City. And how we, <coughs> all these old uh, indigenous groups are related. So basically I did this mini replica of, of the road and I walked from Tijuana to Mexico City, and four people that helped me put together the piece, they walk from Mexico City all the way to LA. But I'll move. I skip this other one. Next time you need to invite us one hour each because mm -hmm. we have a lot to say. This is in China, but I'm gonna go directly to that other one. Which is the, 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 show that I mentioned at the beginning, the, the project. It's a project that uh, David Taylor, a professor at the University of Arizona uh, of photography, and myself, we did uh, two years ago. Uh, and what we did is we, uh, re we trace the border between Mexico and the United States, the, the historical one from 1821 to uh, 1848. So Mexico was twice as big as what is now, uh, many of the states of the South used to belong to Mexico, Texas, Arizona, Nuevo Mexico, uh, California, parts of Colorado, Wyoming, were, uh, were uh, part of Mexico. And then when we lost the Mexican-American War, that was uh, stripped out from us. But uh, that border was never marked. It was a border that only existed in, 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 in treaties. And so we decided to go uh, to the coast of Oregon and, and then trace the 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 border, follow up the information in the treaties, and mark it with uh, 47 uh, obelisk markers, and, 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 and do it, finally uh, do something the history forgot to do. And uh, it took us a month, we prepared for that, and we, we, we had the pieces, every piece was made with, with uh, 12 smaller pieces, and we would make uh, three to four every time, and then we'll go and locate the places by GPS, and put them over there, and while doing them, and we were also photographing the pieces and then rescuing this notion of this idea of the landscape that was never, or is never gonna be supposedly ours again. Uh, we have taken back the land. That is the big problem right now. That's why we are being threatened. Because as you saw, one of the maps there, there's a lot of population already here. There's all those many millions they wanna take out. We are already here in California. The, the, the Latino community is majority, so the whites are the, the big minority, or you know, the first minority of the state of California, and that is all the problem. But here are the, the images. We can start with this joke to soften up, and with this other one, because it's different size of the guards, but okay, those are, the, this, those are the, the ones that we replicated. And this is the first one in the Pacific Ocean, and uh, Brookings, Oregon, and I'm just gonna like push and follow the, tra the trace of the old border. I, um, 
I think one to think that whenever you have a wound, you must have a, a, a scar that correspond to the wound. And we had no scar. We ha only had the wound that is still there between these two nations. And uh, by making uh, this, I wanted to create, to scarify that wound and make it physically there to appear. And, uh, and don't forget about it. The same way that we forgot about the pieces. The pieces were le left behind. We don't know what happened with them. With them. We only been able to visit one site, and it was uh, still there, toppled down, riddled with bullets. People use it to, to sharp shooting or, or practice their shooting. But the piece is still there. I went to try to locate the first one, and it wasn't there. And, but those are the only two ones we have checked. And, uh, and there's a video also. A, there were the two of us plus an Spanish uh, filmmaker that came and made a video that I have also with me in the computer, a 30-minute video about the experience. I guess the color or the, the, the tone or the temperature of the politics right now would make impossible to do something like this. Two years ago, we, were, we had a blast. We were across, we had discussions with people, sometimes really ignited ones, but respectful. And, uh, and it was interesting also that we were an American, an Spaniard, and a Mexican. We made sure to stop in a couple of uh, native reservations and pay homage to them and ask them if, we, if it was possible for us to put one in their land. And they, they were so kind and so nice that they allowed us to put one. And when we explained our project, about this uh, history thing and about uh, migration, about this plane, and about all of the things that represent having a, an event like this historical event, they, in, in a way, ignore us a little bit and start talking between them two, two guys. And, and they, they were from different nations and say, oh, yes, like we, when we talk about the Navajo against the Shoshone, whatever, so they brought it to their realm because everybody has their own problems, their, their own struggles. But uh, at the end, uh, after a month, we were able to, to accomplish the project, and we became, and during the process, uh, a set of three brothers from three different nations, which was and it's the main, the, one of the best gains of the whole endeavor of uh, driving with two guys for a month. So these are the different uh, landscapes. The, this is an exhibition that we presented in the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego also in the Nevada Art Museum in Reno, and in the Mexican Cultural Institute in Washington. And, and it opens uh, Friday in Baja California because the Museum of Baja, the, the, my alma mater, the university that I went to, uh, supported 20% of the project. So that's the last stop up to now of the, of the exhibition. Those are my photographs. Uh, I'm not using uh, David's photographs, which, has, uh, which are like twice as uh, prettier and well taken or whatever, but uh, since he's a photographer, he's kind of sensitive. You know? <laughs> so we present those in the, in the museum, and we use mine for uh, things like uh, this. This is uh, the, way, the way we present the exhibition with all the photographs there. And some uh, road signage, like the roads, the signs that you have, you find when you go to historical sites. We find that most of those uh, uh, sign in, signs were very, very mellow and not representing the real history of the United States. So we found a couple of them were like the, like the gunshot battle between two cowboys in Texas when we knew that back there there was a couple of massacres to Indian tribes. So we did pieces that uh, dealt with that, trying to, to explain history in a better way. Well, it seems to me that the pot is melting. This is the next project. But uh, I hope that we can all make again the world great, not only the United <laughs> States. Thank you very much.
start with some broad establishing questions. Um, ideally, I think we, we'd like this, these questions to turn into conversations between the three of you. Um, and we can always uh, return to the projects to, to hear more about the specifics of projects than anything that we perhaps felt like we went through too quickly. Um, so um, one, one, of, one of the themes that we kind of want to um, build up more is uh, the, the theme of your own experiences with displacement or whether you want to call it migration and, and any kind of the forces that we're kind of uh, working with. Um, just to add some topicality, uh, two nights ago, uh, Gael Garcia Bernal made what seems to most an unobvious statement. Uh, he said, flesh and blood actors are migrant workers. We traveled all over the world. We build families. We construct stories. We build life that cannot be divided. So this statement seems to be in line with one of the basic premises that we're working with with, with displacement and making modern world at large, the series of seminars. In, the, is in that displacement, we're, we're treating it, we're, we're, we're exploring it as an engine in the making of the modern world. Um, so in that sense, it should not be too surprising. And we're going to go from actors to artists and generals and create uh, you know, uh, umbrella in uh, architects and, and all sorts of creative activists. But, so it should not be uh, surprising that artists of all kinds are part of a greater current shaping the world, including forces of displacement, dislocation, migration. Um, so we're kind of hoping if you can comment on this and kind of uh, explore your own relationships to these forces and how perhaps they've affected your careers um, uh, more generally. I just talk a lot. <laughs> You're doing it. <laughs> okay. So, um, I mean, my, um, I, I'm personally, I mean, uh, here it depends what do we mean by uh, displacement, because I'm personally, I didn't have many, my family that was displaced uh, during the war, uh, or I am a refugee myself by intending the fact that uh, I have a, a UN status of, uh, even though I have it, but for other reasons that I would not get into. My grandfather was a, a sort of a clever man, and he thought that it would be good for us to have a UN card, and he managed uh, the same that many mm -hmm. managed to. But so I have a UN card, by matter of fact. But I think that one thing affect me a lot is this, uh, my constant feeling of, uh, you know, I, I sort of, I wasn't by status a refugee, but I all the time felt that I lost the Mediterranean of Palestine that I have no access to. I lost Yaffa. I lost sort of part of a bigger history mm -hmm. that I felt all the time that I am uh, unable to sort of figure out exactly because I was not displaced mm -hmm. physically. Then, I, I mean, in, in that sense, I all the time reflected around what does it mean uh, to be displaced. And I think that one uh, major thing that happened to me all my life, that borders was for me all the time a very threatening uh, uh, place. No, I, I, I was all the time, since almost I born, in the wrong place. Whenever I would cross a border, whenever I'm all the time stopped, I have this feeling that there is no border that would let me in easily and I mean born Palestinian you have all the time this feeling of being the wrong guy in the wrong place and this is why I mean for me displacement is is very much also about right of movement I mean I'm still insisting on this idea of how can we understand <coughs> displacement and refuge from the point of right to movement. And I mean, even if I was not displaced physically from <coughs> one home to another, I was all, I felt all the time that I was not given the right to move freely. And it's there where I felt completely a displaced person and not belonging to the world the way I wanted to belong to and maybe having the right, the wrong passport in that sense. I mean, I also lived in Europe in the period 
of the European euphoria. I lived 13 years of my life in Italy, and my, my PhD in that uh, moment was one of these PhD created in Europe because of this freedom of movement. And while mm -hmm. everybody in Europe was speaking about freedom of movement, I was like, wait a minute. I mean, I'm not free to move. And in that sense, all my PhD was about this. It's just sort of like I was in the middle of people celebrating uh, right of uh, movement while I myself wasn't actually uh, exercising uh, such a right. So maybe this would be my answer. Obvious is the current. The obvious is the current situation that we're in today in this particular political climate that that you brought up, mm -hmm. which is basically um, who is allowed into the United States, who is allowed out of the United States. If you're here at this moment, mm -hmm. so I I'm from I'm a proud I'm privileged to be a citizen of one of these so-called seven countries. And uh, therefore, that means that my own movement is restricted in a particular way at this moment. Um, but having said that, I also kind of want to also emphasize that, um, and maybe this is also building up on what Sandy was saying, the felt artificiality of these borders to begin with, where fundamentally it's not that this is actually a political state that in any form or way I believed in at any moment, including at this current moment where it's undergoing a very violent transformation. The transformation is one that wants to maintain uh, a certain form of dignity, but one that also is trying to understand itself as being part of something that has never actually been. And uh, yeah, I think that's all I have to say. Well, being born uh, in Tijuana, I had the most uh, wide range of neighbors. Tijuana is a very, very cosmopolitan, maybe the most cosmopolitan city of Mexico, even more than Mexico City, I guess in terms that uh, you find people from all over the, the country in that city, and you don't find that many people from Baja California, or Tijuana, and Mexico City. So so, <coughs> uh, so I had uh, neighbors that had, uh, from Michoacan, they, had, they eat different, different meals. Even we were all Mexicans, but uh, in every different household, we had a different culture because it's very multicultural, the, the country. So that was very interesting to me that, uh, that uh, we had a micro universe uh, right there in the city. Plus the the border came natural to me. I I didn't felt threatened uh, by the U.S. or a U.S. officer until I was like 13 years old, and uh, we used there was no fence, so we used to ride our bicycles over the hills and the divided uh, like a buffer zone the two cities. And then when I was just growing the first mustache, we were there, and then an officer stopped us and kicked us back, and then he told us, "Go back. You you don't have papers or you." you we noticed that we were now old enough to become like a threat to them, you know, in a, in a way like a, these, these kids can migrate illegally, whatever. And I was feeling sorry also for those other of my friends that were, have no visa to cross. I could always go back and then get my visa and cross the border. I can tell you also that I have never ever felt discriminated in this country, which can be strange. But I attribute that that I, nev I don't go in the world feeling threatened for nothing. This is starting to change now. Uh, in one of my ex expeditions to Europe, I, th I think uh, the first clear um, um, tr uh, threatened or offensive uh, racist comment was from a guy uh, from Spain. And I had, uh, I can be incisive, so I gave him the same medicine. And he was so offended to me, to me but I, we're not going to get into that. It really, I t had to tell him, you know, this is the first time ever in my life that I feel that someone wants to discriminate me, you know? And I told some stuff that, it, as I mentioned, is a strong. So he was like almost running away from me every time that he saw me in the, in the art fair. But uh, not in, 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 in my, my land, you know? Like I mentioned before that I had uh, a green card and my father gave it away and then I, w I and then became illegal migrant, and once driving around one of the fancy neighborhoods in, in, in San Diego, I was driving my fire old car had California plates, and at the time, since I was illegal, I had only like a, a visa that allowed me to cross as a tourist. But uh, since, since I had this uh, uh, card before, the, 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 the naturalization card, I had a, a social security number, and I had an address with my aunt's 
uh, on my aunt's uh, name or whatever. So I had a California li driver license and a visa that doesn't allow me to be there. It's a contradiction. So the, the police stopped us, and then, and then I had my, my friend with me, who's a di dentist, had a, one of these charro hats, like the one that I showed her in the restaurant, mm -hmm. and a sarape. So he was like a really a stereotypical of a Mexican, so the guy stopped us because of him. And he asked uh, his information, uh, he couldn't ask his information, so he called the Border Patrol. The Border Patrol came, this is like, like an African-American lady, like 6'2", huge, imposing, very imposing, and asked him his, his documents, so he pulled his passport, and, and then since he's a dentist, he pulled a, a, like a presentation card and made a joke about the, like, if you need any services, I'm here to provide it to you, whatever, or you can find me in this location in Mexico. And then she directed to me, and the officer already had my green card, my, my uh, license with my address from California, so he asked me my citizenship. So I said, I'm an American citizen. And she said, no, you're not. And I said, no, yes, I am. And so we started like discussing it, and she's, since she didn't believe me, she says, you want to go in the van. So I went in the van, and I had the ride of my life for one day, and saw all of the things that these people do to my fellow people, Mexicans, in the hills of Tijuana. And maybe, I, I told them in the morning, uh, maybe in the audience we're going to have a couple of FBI agents because now we get, we're going to get into that point if the, we don't stop this craziness soon. But uh, this is are things that I don't have to, not supposed to say, but uh, it's important to say them because they took me around. I saw a couple of things that were terrible, and then uh, they threw me at the very end into a, an office, and then uh, the, a, guy, a Mexican uh, a guy, an officer from Mexican origin, uh, Sergeant Aguirre, called me and asked me why, why I said that I was a U.S. citizen when I wasn't, obviously. And I said, well, why you, why you, why are you saying that I'm not? I know already that you're not, he said. Why you did this? They first took my fingerprints and everything. And I told the same story. There is a story in which I based the last project that I did. I said, for me, this is my land. I was born in this area. I, I was born five blocks away from the border, and I crossed all my life. So don't tell me that I'm not a citizen of this place. I, I said it to protect myself. and. I, and that. So we, the conversation went on, and he said, I'm not going to arrest you, and I'm, I'm not going to like, uh, do nothing to you, because your, pa your father was here 30 minutes ago, and he told me the same story. So I should throw in jail your father instead of you. But don't repeat ever this uh, conversation to any judge or whatever, because that's sedition, and you can go to go to jail. So I left there with my passport and my, and my license, and then I went back the next day to work and stay there for a week instead of coming every day. And eventually I got my papers back. But I went, during that time that was illegal, illegal, I was living in the United States. And curiously enough, whenever I got my right to be a permanent resident in the United States, the first thing that I did is pack all my stuff, throw it in my pickup truck, and go to Tijuana to live again. Because I never have felt displaced, but I, I have been feeling sometimes misplaced. And uh, this is also enough of a feeling. And, and I, I love being a resident, but if I'm asked, where do you decide to stay? Do you want the, all the benefits and all the things that you can get in the United States? You have to be here at this side of the line or go to the uncertainty and the poverty of Mexico, I will take a second in a bit. So it's good at least that you have the choice, the choice to make and you can make it. And um, I guess I'll follow this up with a with a second kind of related dinner, um, second related uh, question, perhaps uh, thinking of kind of moving toward the institutions mm -hmm. that you're a part of and perhaps something productive about these forces. So again, I, I like introducing things through little anecdotes. But uh, so w while reading your bios when we were working on this, uh, it became very apparent that you all have ostensibly what reads as many different careers or, or jobs throughout your lives. Um, and, and a common anecdote is that the typical modern person has in her life 10 different jobs before the age of 40 or four, five to seven different careers. Um, can you speak to the role of, of migration, displacement, whatever you feel comfortable with, in shaping your career paths and perhaps shaping the institutions that you're a part of? And does this kind of play into how you conceive of the institution, say of architecture, say of, of being a visual artist? Is, do you see something, um, 
how how do these different institutions kind of feed into the other into your work that you're doing? Okay, uh, I will a bit try to uh, articulate this in a, a bit of a different angle. Is that Please. if I feel free, I feel exactly free for uh, this reason, and in that sense, I all the time says, you know, I'm never enough architect. I'm never enough academic. I'm never enough artist. I'm not accepted by any of these disciplines fully, mm -hmm. but in a sense, I am part of all this. And I think that this is, this gave me a freedom that I was so conscious of, that I will never give up for anything in the world. And I mean, I will try to, ex for example, I, I worked as, you know, a very technocrat in the UN, my position was heading a program in terms of, you know, urban planning, architecture, drawing maps, and, and I can ensure you, really, but in a, in a very incredible way, is that my colleagues never know anything else about whatever else I was doing. For them, I was a very typical technocrat, but in the same moment, I mean, even people that sort of research this camp improvement program and how it went in the West Bank, says that it went, compl I mean, Ilana Feldman, for example, told me one thing that she, she's very much working on this, the whole humanitarian aspect of refugee camps. And she says, you know, I think that you managed to do something with the camp improvement program that I never saw. And she says, this is the part of development that she is now looking at very carefully in the humanitarian aid thing. And she says, you know what? I think that you did all this because you was never afraid of losing your job in the UN. I mean, my um, aims were completely different. Once I was sitting with, with the guy in the legal office. You know, and one of the things that, for example, I had as a, a very important, I, I never wanted to become uh, fully a, a UN uh, uh, official because in that sense, I wanted all the time to maintain my position of a consultant. And this would permit me to sit, criticize UNRWA, uh, be able to be free, and I will all the time claim I am a consultant, you know, in that sense. But in one of the uh, meetings between me and uh, the, the legal office guy, he was sort of speaking about the non-impossibility for me to speak freely. At the end of the day, you know, I was a uh, a UN official, whatever I will be speaking about will take as a UN thing. And I was asking, I, I was a bit, also I wanted from this meeting to understand what is the maximum that I can have as a problem in that sense, if my voice would be something that legally would be unaccepted. And he says, you will lose your job. And I looked at him and I told him, that's it. And he okay. says, yes, and I say, legally, you can do anything else and he says, no, I mean, you will simply lose your job. And for him, this, is, this was like the maximum threat that I would feel. And in my mind, I thought, wow, it would be an honor for me at the end of the day, you know, to be fired from the UN because I was trying to do something that is out of this agenda. So in that sense, you know, and also because I knew that the day after, I will not be in the scenes of the film when you lose your job completely, you know, oh my God, I lost my job, what should I do now and looking for, no, I mean, I would have 100 things the day after on my agenda that it would be a relief for me to be fired from UNRWA. And I think that in that sense, this, is, this was seriously my treasure, no, my freedom, because I wasn't, I mean, I didn't need the recognize from any of these any of the, I mean, I didn't need to be fully recognized from the art or that I need to be recognized from uh, uh, the, the American University as a, a, a tenure track or, I mean, I, I don't need, I know that now that I don't need all this. And having a leg in each one of these without being disciplined, I mean, I think that I, uh, you know, I, uh, we call it discipline, no? Is mm -hmm. that you are inside the discipline. Somebody is disciplining you. Mm -hmm. And I think that I managed during my career, and I'm so proud of it, not to be disciplined. No? And maybe because being a Palestinian, I was all the time under occupation. I was disciplined from the first exact moment I was, you know, born. 
at least in my career life, I decide not to maybe to decolonize my mind and not to accept any of these disciplines, which open up strangely for me. All these disciplines are open now. I mean, but in my own terms, not in the terms of the discipline in that sense. And I believe that this is my main freedom. This is from where the autonomy of the works uh, come. So, yeah. Um, that's difficult to follow up. But, um, <laughs> I, I'll start by disagreeing. I, I am very disciplined. Uh, I have never changed careers. I, um, um, I've been fired a few times. And, uh, but maybe it's, maybe it's partially because I kind of very strongly believe in, I'm looking for certain things, I think, in, in, in all the work that I've done. Um, both as a child and sort of like as I've grown older. And um, that thing probably doesn't belong within a certain disciplinary logic that is recognized. But I don't think that this kind of work that I try to do as an architect professionally or as an art historian now in training is, is fundamentally that, that, dis that different. Um, yeah, if I had to choose discipline or non-discipline, I would clearly sort of like stick to discipline because for me that actually means something about commitment to an idea, even if that idea is somehow un unclear even to myself who's committed to it. Can I try to, I mean, it's yeah, very No, it's a conversation, please. Sort of and if you'd like some that. water. I mean, it's, it's, it seems a bit, str I mean, when I looked at, uh, uh, you know, I, I was a bit looking at who are you with before coming here and trying to do my homework. And I thought that, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. I thought uh, about myself years ago. I mean, certainly we have a bit of an age uh, difference, but I think that the invitation from the art work world, even if it was an, I mean, an architect in that sense, mm -hmm. call us, but still I think that having a leg in architecture and trying to understand how this architecture would be part of the art world and then how this would be uh, still having something that is happening in Syria is, I, I don't think that this is completely, that you are disciplined in, in many ways. I don't see it this way. I have to disagree because when I looked at your, uh, uh, background, I felt it wasn't um, really uh, not, uh, the case. So I, I would sort of revise uh, this because I mean, from my, uh, uh, and, and invite you to revise it because it's very important also to understand how can we uh, still be breaking uh, such borders, still be understanding, because I think that it is a very interesting condition that we should uh, maybe try to sort of articulate better, understand better. And I was so happy actually to be among both of you because I felt in a sense, you know, it's, there is a bit of similarity in that sense that we occupy most probably certain places that we don't belong fully to and, and we made out of it uh, sort of our own uh, inhabitants way. But let me maybe try to say one more thing in that sense, you know, one, major thing I was m accused of when I finished my work in Anarwa after seven years is that, you know, I was never loyal to this agency. No, they Amazing. felt, I mean, one of the major things that disturbed them out of me being there, and it was quite clear from some colleagues is that they never felt I was enough loyal to this agency. But I have to say, I mean, in my mind, of course, this hits me. It wasn't an easy, because especially it comes from colleagues that you sort of, and, and I felt as if I was betraying something or that I didn't do enough in order for this project to go on. But then I realized that at the end of the day, most probably my loyalty a lot of time goes to projects that I'm doing rather than to institutions. No, and in that sense, it wasn't, it wasn't a loyalty to the UN. I didn't identify completely with myself as an UN official, but what I identify with is the relation I had with refugees, and I managed to deploy, in that sense, ANERWA, in order for it to be doing certain things on the ground. And in that sense, I mean, if loyalty was to the U, if my loyalty was to the UN in that sense, or to that discipline or to that other discipline, most probably I will not feel uh, free 
and also strong enough to sort of understand how can I uh, sort of uh, you know manage a, a big institution and super bureaucratic like the UN and manage to do to employ it to do certain projects in, on the ground in refugee camps. And I think that this comes only and exclusively because I was sort of not enough loyal to. And in that sense, I think that we should understand what does it mean to have loyalty to a discipline, not to have to be accused of being not loyal. I think I'm inviting all of us. And I don't know, I feel that the three of us sitting on the table sharing this uh, idea of you yourself, you know, you, you stand there and you say, I'm not the artist, but the people that are on the ground. I mean, you still have this feeling of, I mean, for me also, each time I'm called an artist, I'm just like, who are they speaking about? You know, it's just, um, I don't feel myself an artist. And, and in a sense, this is the point, is that we are uncomfortable each time. And in, in your case also, no, when you spoke about being a lawyer first, and then construct, uh, 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 you know, really? being a cons builder. And then all this is in your work very clearly. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in, in that sense, I don't know. We should not give up with this idea. I mean, that, uh, yes, we managed to put a lot of uh, pieces and pieces together. And, and this what, and I have to say that one, one thing that we repeat all the time, me and by my partner, this is our strongest part of the work, but it is the weakest part of it. I mean, all the time, your strongest part is your weakest part. And, and certainly, the fact that we are not recognized by one discipline is, a, is a, of course, it, it might appear as a very, and we live this sometimes as, as a, you know, a, sometimes social frustration of recognition or of this or of that. But in the same time, it is our I mean, on the other hand, it's the most powerful thing that we are managing to do. So, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to be among you to be able to discuss all these things because I think that there is a bit of communality and then I'm inviting the group to think about it more. Yeah, uh, I, I guess the, the, the individual processes are just different. I don't see why we are, when I, we are defining our process or the way we interact with these so-called institutions. It, you can call it disagreeing, which is one person is one way, one other person is another way, and we tackle or, or live our life in a different way. Like, I only have been these three things. I, I never, I finished law school, I never, I, when I was 20 years old, I graduated from law school, and I only worked like eight months with my uncle, that was like the moral ruler of our family, and then it took me another six months to find out that he was very crooked, and he was very corrupted, and he, he was in a process of making me to his uh, image, and then I didn't want to do that, become part of that. And, and but I'll also, as an artist or as a person, not necessarily as an artist, I'm a very selfish person that I, that I realized that I was not good enough, good to become like a, a, a lawyer to that would do pro bono work and sacrifice the next 20 years of his life or the rest of his life to save the world, and it was not also going to be a corrupted lawyer. So I said, I. <laughs> Strong, strong, I can try something else. There's other interest for me. And that's why I try to, to go and, and do the only job that I've done in the US, besides that, being an artist and teach one or two classes, is starting construction. My father went and talked to my cousin, which was the lead uh, carpenter of the company, and said, I want to make sure that you send them back in, like, in a month. I want them back in the office. And, and my, my cousin, after two weeks, told, told me what my father asked the quest. And I said, I want to be here for a while. I want to learn this trade. And so they kept me. So I ended up staying for 17 years. I know now that was too much. But, uh, but I, something that I mention always is that uh, if I'm good for something, and I'm really proud of that, and I can say I'm an amazing carpenter. I'm an amazing carpenter. I'm very good. I'm the best I know, <laughs> even if it's a lie. You know? But I don't want to be just a carpenter. I want to be, if I'm the worst, Artists, I don't care. I want to do what I want to do, and I have my projects as well as you say, and I pursue them, you know? And then I will try to do as best as I can, and by doing that, I will bring in my other two personalities that are, suit me really well, and I love them. And then it's the same way that I try to raise my kids, you know? And then that, that has given me this new trade and this new discipline, giving me opportunity to take some uh, revenges that I want to, like uh, to wrapping up the whole cycle. After doing this 
piece uh, that I forgot to mention, the, the, the limitation piece was under the umbrella of the site, Santa Fe Biennial. We had to go back and give a presentation about the project, and then uh, we, gave, we gave it in a movie theater, so we have exactly one hour to, to give the presentation. We finished the presentation, and then we had no time for questions and answers or whatever, so they, we went directly to a dinner. And we were placed, my friend, the American photographer, and myself, in two tables, like 10 and 10 people, and after a couple of uh, bottles of wine, one of the, the, the collectors, one of the rich guy, white guy, was brave enough to ask me a question. So it's like, uh, now that we, we couldn't ask the question, but can we make questions now? And, and, uh, and obviously he was a little bit intoxicated, and, and, and then, but a little bit, but, uh, but he asked me, what is all about your project? Are you planning on taking back the land? Do you think you have the rights? And that was the exact moment for me to bring out my DNA thing. And I said, I, you know what? I just did my DNA. And it happens to be that uh, reviewing this thing, that I have family that traveled through here 10,000 years ago. Do you think that I have a right to this land? Do you have a better proposal? Do you have a, the pedigree, which is kind of rude, but that he sh 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 shut down, shut off, because this is like, most probably, you arrived like my father 200 years ago, and then you're asking me if I have the right. I think this is an open world. We can always be whatever we want, as long as, as, as we can, and everybody else deal with it, you know? So we need to stay. Uh, me, if you ask me, that's, that's, yeah. that's the thing. So, um, in the interest of time, let's, uh, we had a couple more questions prepared, but we wanted to open it up to the general audience if they have any comments or queries for the, uh, our panelists. I'm, I'm Shereen Sensi, and I'm a professor in anthropology. Uh, wait, wait until you, oh. the, you get the mic. Yeah. It's because we're live streaming. I'm an anthropology, anthropology faculty here. Um, thank you so much. These three were really, really wonderful. And um, I, so I wanted to, for Sandy, I wanted to um, comment first and then ask a question. So my first comment, I loved how you brought out the whole, like the refugees wanting to be temporal and transient for that narrative of right which And I guess my comment was just that that's also on so many scales of Palestinian life in general. So even like in Ramallah, when they wanted to open a nightclub, there's all this debate about like, wait, should we be partying? And, and even in Palestinian academics in the United States, this like silencing where they can't be, you know, pro gender, or pro queer rights, or pro anything. They have to like only be these victims and refugees, or or people who are pro Palestinian white Americans not wanting the Palestinian to speak for themselves because then they'll be out of a job. So I just like that multiple amount of silencing for me was just really struck home, um, and I think. The, the, the idea of like we can't move, we can't change, would also freeze people in time. To, this, is, this is segueing into my question. Is also related to this kind of post-colonial maybe defensiveness of like don't try to change our culture, this is our cultural way, but then it also has this orientalist idea of freezing in time, like we're not allowed to change. And, and so like I love the way you talked about getting the women to appreciate this piazza. And it almost it made me think of like the way we would tell our grandmothers, like, no, you you deserve this nice fluffy, you know, ship ship to wear or whatever, you know, like that kind of resistance. But I think it also like how do we articulate that or how do we explain that as change that they themselves aren't on board with if our biggest critique of colonial practices is that they would impose different ideas of what's good for the natives, right? And I, like I can see totally how that's not what you were doing, but just if you have like a way to articulate yeah, that. Yeah. So I don't know. I think that one of the major uh, things that hits me personally, I mean, we are speaking about uh, personal uh, feelings here is that, you know, I, I worked my, um, in, in the past years, a bit between uh, refugee camps, and then I was a co-founder of uh, a, a collective called Decolonizing Architecture Art Residency, which is DAR. And it was all about, you know, we began with settlement and the whole idea of decolonization, and we are architects, so we have a sort of a tool into understanding how you decolonize certain things in terms of uh, material decolonization. 
But then doing all this, I arrived to a point that I, you know, when we spoke about decolonizing camps or uh, decolonizing the right of return, I was so scared because it, it bit touched a minimum of me that I was unable to move on. No, I, it was a red line. No, it's just like, wait a minute, we cannot think about, uh, you know, what does it mean? This is a sort of, this is our uh, narration again, no, our narration. And then, you know, it hits me that even this narration was completely colonized because, I mean, I will invite you to think about this, is that how can, how we speak about the right of return is how, the, I mean, how Israelis and the whole colonial project would like, would love us to continue speaking about it. No, we are speaking about it as five million Palestinians that are going in one day after a UN assembly to come back and destroy the state of Israel. And I was realizing more and more that what I think that was mine was in many times, in many ways, a complete colonial imposition. And then, you know, it hits me that I was able to begin to decolonize my mind in my own way. And this was the only freedom that I had. You know, Israelis was able to colonize my body, to prevent me from moving, to colonize my country, to colonize everything. But I realized that it was possible for me and to bring many others with me to sort of a process of decolonization where we are not tied by a certain red lines. And that, I mean, by sort of understanding what is our own narration, and it's the same that we are doing with refugees. No, refugee community, we are speaking with uh, guys that are 20, 23 years old, and still speaking about Palestine the way their grandfather was speaking about it. And they say, we would love, actually, to have the right of, narr of narrating our own story. And for me, this is the way we decolonize our mind. And I think that it's, for me, it's about, I'm not afraid anymore of what they would, you know, impose on me or, this is, this, this was, this is the major spirit of colonialism, is that they would not, pre they would prevent you from thinking, how can I move on? You know, what is my life and how can I think about it beyond uh, this? And I think that, you know, for me, li I lived, I come back from Italy. I, I am also having an Italian passport. I mean, I have the privilege to be able to live in Italy and we decided to, to return back to Palestine and with my Italian husband So and, and, and to have a practice there. And I think that one major thing that we both shared I from Itali Italian point of view and from a Palestinian point of view, that we both felt the need, the extreme need to decolonize our mind, one coming from a, a colonialism part of it and one coming from the colonized part, but we shared a desire to sort of practice decolonize, a, a, a practice of decolonizing our mind that brought us to many places. And in that sense, you know, I'm not worried. I think that uh, it, this is the liberation. This is the way for me to be able to live in Palestine. This is the way for me to be able to live everywhere. And I'm hoping for myself that I will never stop this process of decolonization and that I will die still decolonizing my mind. I mean, this is the only thing that I'm really sort of desiring for my uh, future and that I will be doing it with as, mu as much people as I can. So it's, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you all of you. It was great to all and um, tell your story. Uh, so this is a question for Sandy again. Um, I'm listening to well, all, all three of you actually talking about you know jumping between disciplines, jumping between professions. Now we're talking about decolonization, decolonizing the mind, and sort of always being in between in this liminal space. So I'm just I want to go back to your talk, and I'm wondering about the binaries that you chose to I mean sort of frame your work: the collective versus the individual, and the, um, the collective. What was the other one? The collective versus the individual and the public and the, and the private. And some of the examples that you gave, especially the one to do with the women in the square, I very much felt actually it touches on both. So I didn't quite understand when you're placing your work, when you, use, when you use the public, when you use the private. And most of it is, we know the Middle East, most of it is somewhere in between. 
both of these binaries. It's never this or that. So I'm actually, thank you very much for this question. I didn't. I mean, I, I uh, sort of. I need to clarify if this yeah. is what uh, because I think that exactly our practice is trying to position itself not in the public and not in the private. And we spoke. <coughs> we wrote about the concept called al masha in uh, in the Arab world, and al masha is a sort of collective place that, I mean, it was very much the place around many villages that people would uh, go, because it's far away from the village, so people are afraid to go there and cultivate the land together. So what they will be doing is that they will go all uh, together and sort of cultivate the land, no, in that sense. And it's, it's uh, the masha is collective as long as you activate it. And it stopped to be collective and it will come back to the, in that sense, to the Ottoman uh, period when, when it's not anymore used by people. So in that sense, what I, I don't know if this is the maybe where we more nearby is that what we are creating in refugee camps is much more, and what we see in refugee camps is much more a space that is activated by the people and constantly activated. So it doesn't belong neither to the category of the public, neither to, cate to the cat category of the private, and it's overlapping. I mean, we don't see any, and it's in the contrary. I think that the force is in this overlapping between the public and the private. And if you would ask me what the, the piazza is, the piazza is a sort of uh, almost an outside living room. I mean, it's not, uh, this is like a turn, turning, the profaning the private, uh, profaning the public into a sort of other use. I mean, it is about profaning the public, I think. All our work is to try to understand how to profane something and profane in that sense to make is a, a, another use of it. How to profane the public that was completely expropriated from us. I mean, only think about that Sokoti Park in New York. Now, where people manage to go out and sort of have their voice in the only in in the public in the private property that is used as public. And we believe more and more that the public was completely expropriated from us, from all of us, and not by chance. I mean, you call it Occupy movement. I mean, you feel that it's not yours and you are occupying it. We arrive to a point that we feel, I mean, coming from Palestine, the world occupation uh, is, is a world that is, I mean, in, and you feel in New York that you are occupying a place means that you don't feel with sort of complete ownership to this place. So our work is all about understanding how you can overlap this private and public and maybe go nearer to a position where you activate a common uh, place that, that, that is, is yours as long as you activate it. And then it's not, you, it's not belong to you forever because of papers or legally. So, yeah. Uh, wonderful panel, thank you so much. Uh, question maybe for all of you, one of you can answer if you want because I only have five minutes left, I know. Uh, what struck me as a common thread is this power of emplacing. That is to say, displaced people emplace themselves or somewhere. And in this daily struggle for survival, this process of emplacing creates a set of affective, subjective, and other kinds of relationships that cannot be denied, that cannot be just simply melted away and under the banner of some political slogan. This is what I understood. And even in the places almost as impossible as the Ruta, people find ways to emplace themselves there. Uh, and in, in, in your work, I, I thought that you were emplacing yourself everywhere you went <laughs> <laughs> to say that I'm a human being and I belong everywhere in the world. Um, so my question, if it is a question, is this. Um, what happens then to politics as we know it in, in this kind of situation? Uh, under what kinds of uh, collective political projects can we then engage? Uh, I see many of these things as sort of little fires that are spread all over the world, and there isn't anything that's bringing them together. And uh, everywhere I go and every Thing I see, I, I see wonderful people doing wonderful things, and I'm wondering, is there a space, or can you imagine a space in which these fires can be then connected somehow? Uh, yes. 
we wouldn't be doing, I, I don't think I would be doing this kind of work if I didn't imagine such a place. Uh, whether that place will happen tomorrow or in 10 years, I, I have no idea. But I think that there are multiple places. People are doing work that is new, that is created. Trying to, I, I think I have a little bit, uh, to go back to sort of like the beginning of your, your comment and your question, it's more the logic of where does the politics, like where is the politics in this? And I do think that I'm very conservative, disciplined, whatever, old fashioned in the sense that I do strongly believe that, take for example this so-called revolution, like what a beautifully loaded term. Um, it took a revolution in Syria for me, somebody who with an architectural training, to actually be able to sit down over Skype, mind you, with a blacksmith and a, an architecture student and collectively try to produce this project together where fundamentally all of the knowledge fundament comes from somewhere else. I was just able to sort of like do very basic project management and secure funding because I could write in a language that in, that in a slightly more elegant way than maybe somebody else could have. And fundamentally, I, as somebody who's from a country that he doesn't believe in that is undergoing revolution. I really strongly feel that it's by hanging on to words like that and to the kind of social relations that are produced from these places and times that this kind of collective fire that you're describing can erupt. And personally, I can only imagine that fire in a very poetic sense because fundamentally that's the thing that I'm committed to beyond, uh, even beyond justice, frankly. I don't know, I see questions, but I would like a bit also to uh, reply to this. I think that what, when, and in that sense, I want to use also uh, your uh, uh, presentation, because when I saw your presentation, what, what remind me a lot of is the first intifada in Palestine. And, and in a sense, your work was how can uh, the people in such places be completely self-organized in a way that they would not need uh, the rest of, uh, of, of the surrounding. And in that sense, you know, uh, films like The Wanted 18 or A Place Where I Born, like Bet Sahur, that freaked out a whole colonial uh, sort of uh, structure and machine from the first moment that we decide to produce our own milk. I mean, why you are afraid that three people from Beit Sahur, which is a, a sort of, uh, I don't know where, uh, is, is producing their own milk? Why you are afraid? You are afraid because you are losing completely power. We don't speak with you anymore. We sort of speak among ourselves. And I think that this is also very strong in refugee camps when you realize that you can sort of create this moment where it's not that you are only speaking to the power, but you take the thing of the power out, no, in, in that sense. And I think that there is a force out of, uh, out of all this. I mean, when I looked at your work, when I see what is happening in refugee camps, when I, I it's, there is a, a, a moment where, when they began to clean Maidan uh, tahrir I mean, there are these moments that, unfortunately, for many reasons, they are not uh, able to still. But that doesn't mean that we n we need to give up. I mean, Maidan tahrir in one day transforms to be the most ugly public space that belonged to the regime into a place where where we, where people were cleaning it. We were all accused all our times as Arabs that we don't clean our public spaces. But why should they clean the house of my enemy? I mean, it's they are regimes. They are killing me and so I, I should even take the my thing and go out and clean it but from the first time I feel it's belonging to me I'm cleaning it back again so I don't know I'm, I I my I see these forces coming together whenever we get down in the street and try to clean it and it's there where I see again the overlapping between this uh, public and the private I mean we we were the colonialism is about taking your public out you know t taking anything out of you and <coughs> transform you into numbers inside the houses. So anything that would go and break this and, and say, you know, we can still, even if we are in four, we will be cleaning this place and make sure that it works beyond colonialism and outside of this or the war or whatsoever. I think that this is what we, this is the only 
uh, hope that we have. No, I, I don't see any other things for also for us to be able to still uh, living in a good way. I don't know. I, I don't see it. It's a, a personal uh, matter. How can I still be living? No, if I don't have this uh, hope. It's, uh, um, for for the sake of time, I'm going to let Marcos uh, end this with his. Uh, view on this. Um, if we want to continue, perhaps we can but ask questions a, after. I have a burning question, yeah. but it, it was actually for Marcos, so that, that okay. would be perfect since you haven't spoken yet. Um, my name is Nifa, and I'm transiting through Brown as a researcher and musician, so I really appreciated where you were coming from. I noticed in all three of your talks, I wanted to introduce another category, which was innovation, which was something I saw that was really part and parcel to this kind of dialogue of creativity and displacement. Um, but I had a question related to that. I mean, all of your stories, whether it was a true story of innovation in Khaled's work, the story of the right of return, um, s seem to talk about this concept of uh, almost, um, or actually I thought in your work, Marcos, uh, a lot of Guillermo Gomez Pena's work, he talks about migration, M-Y-Gration. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and also your story, he, he actually talks about how he's always stopped at the, uh, at the border because he looks like, a cross between a border dandy and a generic Latino outlaw mm -hmm. because of his thick mustache. Uh, he's a performance artist. In any case, um, what I wanted to ask in, in relation to this idea is that something you didn't mention, it didn't come up, that word didn't come up in any of your talks, was this concept of resistance that has been so much a dialogue that's part of displacement. Rather, it seemed like with the concept of innovation and the ways that you intervene, there's this um, image or language of change agency that's so much a part of all three of your stories. So I just wanted to know kind of where that word uh, resistance kind of comes into the dialogue, or is it you know, through this idea of creative displacement that we're almost creating, or there's a necessity to create a paradigm shifting meta language for what it means to innovate and displace or to move beyond this idea of resistance in a certain sense. So I was just curious your thoughts on resistance or if we're beyond resistance or how that language kind of interplays while you innovate in the works that you do. Well, the, I, I, one of the last images that I, that I presented is the one that said uh, the pot is melting. There's a, a series of uh, pieces that I'm doing now. <coughs> one, another of the, they're gonna be in display in, in, display in, in, a, in a month. The other one is one that, uh, that's just to imagine it is a, a, a piece that says history has disappeared, and then the, the letter, his, the letters, history, the word is is cut off from the middle. But there's another one that that, um, that I'm doing actually right now that says think, dissent, resist. So the, this is going to be if we don't work fast, this is going to be like uh, an urgency, you know, like. A, I've been uh, working on the same subjects for many, many years, and, and then, like now, like in Mexico, in the Mexican art world, now it's uh, fashionable to be a political art artist. But uh, like when I started doing my work, uh, and 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 uh, Gabriel Orozco show in the scene, uh, he was the cool thing was like to be uh, a, a person with no identity. Like they, 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 people can say this piece. It could be made by an Austrian artist or, or New Zealander or whatever, and not necessarily uh, find any trace that is a Mexican, the one, the, the one that made it. But the, his last project it deals with the, with the political subjects in in in, in, uh, in Mexico, which is not bad. Uh, but I don't know if he at least uh, now he's understanding there's subjects that are beyond or, or far more important than art itself for the sake of it. And so I think I want to believe that I've been resisting. But uh, or persisting, you know, in, in the topics that I want to bring into the into the table. But I, I don't know. I think I do it in a way that uh, uh, maybe I it's a fiction and I exaggerate and I and I want to believe that I do it from a very proud in the good sense of the world standpoint. When my kids that were born in the U.S. asked me, they asked me when I were like eight years old, like, am I am I a, am I a, a Mexican? Have Mexican and have American? And 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 then I said. Well, I don't agree with you. I'm going to tell you my point of view. There's one thing you're never going to be, which is a gringo. So you're not going to be ever going to be that because you're not. But you are not 50% Mexican, 50% American. Such a thing doesn't exist. You are 100% Mexican and 100% American. And that's for your advantage, not for to be your your your. Uh, again, it, it's not working against you. So 
with those premises, I do the work with a lot of uh, being really proud of what I do and intending to also uh, contaminate my fellow Mexicans with the same the same thing. I did a, 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 a performance piece with a chess game in which I had a, a booze, very it's a kind of silly piece, but it's it's a Budweisers and and, uh, and whiskey in one side against uh, tequila and Coronas on the other side, and then the crowd in the exhibition without knowing I invite them to play chess. And I said, we're going to play uh, white people against the rest of the world. And then uh, you can conform. You, whoever wants to play, you can conform the team. It's going to be a team of five each. And we want to play, and we're going to drink whatever, we, whatever <laughs> pieces that we, that, we, uh, that we conquer. And uh, you have five minutes to, to get together and, and decide it. And, and the public is going to help us because there's a lot of booze. So I have blue cups and green cup and green cups the green cups are for the mexican brazilian or whatever latin american whatever. and uh, the other ones are going to be for the anglo and there was a, this jewish lady that says i don't know what i am because i don't i don't fall in any of the categories so, so it's freedom for you choose your your side and we um the the, the piece is called the bottle field and i was celebrating that i just like a month ago before that that performance California was, as I mentioned, like a majority Latino population. And I said, in the, before the game, 150 years ago we lost this land, and it took 150 years to recuperate it in a way. It is not the same name. It's not uh, under the flag of Mexico, whatever, but it's the people recuperating the land that they lost. And, uh, but we can share it, and we, instead of going through another battle, let's go to a, through this bottle field and celebrate that, that event. So... Obviously, there's always a leader, so the, the two teams started like, a, they were supposed to choose every movement, one each person, and I was one guy trying to impose the, his will into the others to make them move and win. The, it was not about winning, it was about just having fun. And then uh, it got to a point that uh, some of the players, in order to be able to drink a beer, they surrendered some of the... <laughs> the bottles to be taken and whatever. So, so it's very complex. It's very complex to, to even in this uh, uh, replica or re, in this exercise to to for the, for people to really take it seriously or I don't know. It's it's, it's, it's it was a very interesting uh, uh, experiment, and it seemed to me that we were going safely into the dark direction. But now, a year after. I can see that there's another idea in certain groups that, that this cannot be like this. And, and, then, and then, as again, we are going against the, the mainstream of one political party or group, and then we will have to resist again. You know, like, a, but, I, but I guess it's not an exercise that we have to do forever. I'm willing to. Yeah. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to thank our, our, our generous guests. Um, thank you so much for those wonderful talks. Um, I guess um, uh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs>